Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Brittany Higginbotham, and I'm a communications associate for the Institute for Public Relations. Thank you for joining us today for an IPR webinar on the new USC Annenberg Report, The Future of Corporate Activism. Today, our speaker, Fred Cook, will present the findings of this report, and we will con conclude with a Q&A. Before we begin, I have a few reminders. First, we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box, and we'll allot time at the end of the webinar to um, answer a few audience questions. You're welcome to use the chat box at any time to leave comments, share resources, um, et cetera. But please note that an IPR staff member will be moderating questions throughout the Q&A only. If you have any logistical questions or technological difficulties during today's webinar, feel free to private message any of the IPR staff members in the Zoom chat. And then this webinar will be recorded and available for playback on our website and YouTube channel as well as the resources that are shared during this webinar. So I'll do a introduction of our speaker today, Fred Cook, who has worked at Golan for over 30 years, during which he has had the privilege to work with a variety of high profile CEOs, including Herb Keller, Jeff Bezos, and Steve Jobs. He also has managed a wide variety of clients, including Nintendo, Toyota, and Disney. Fred is also the director of the USC Center for Public Relations at USC Annenberg, whose mission is to shape the future of public relations and those who will lead it through research, education, and thought leadership. Okay, so Fred, I'll hand it over to you. If you'd like to begin sharing at any time, you can take it away. Can you see the slides now, Brittany? Can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank, thanks to all of you who have uh, signed into Zoom to see this and hear me uh, talk about corporate activism. Um, as Brittany said, I've been in, at Golan for a long time, and uh, I've been at USC for the last five years, and, and we do a couple of pieces of research every year in conjunction with the Institute, um, and one is the Global Communications Report. And we always try to find interesting aspects of the public relations profession to talk about. We've done one on ethics, on media, on technology, um, on the merger with marketing. And each year um, we find, I, I'm always trying to sort of put a, a flag in the ground about what public relations is all about. And, and, and although our surveys are always interesting, I don't think we've ever done that until this year. And uh, I think this report really describes what our business is gonna be like for the next five years and gives us a, a purpose that I think is, is growing in importance. So I hope that you enjoy it. Um, you can get copies of this on our website. If you want the hard copies, we have these nice little booklets. You can send me an email, I'll send you one. And uh, it is a survey that we conduct in, in conjunction with IPR and a, and a number of other notable groups. Uh, they distribute it around the world, and we get about a thousand responses, some from agencies, some in-house, of PR people, and we ask them what they think about a topic. And this year, we focused on corporate activism, and I'm going to share those results with you and talk to you a little bit about my, my interpretation of them, and then answer some questions at the end. So without further ado, I'll jump right in. Um, let me see. No, that's great. The slide isn't advancing. No. Nope. Oh, there we go. First, I want to say that for the first time in a long time, or these last few years, when you ask people what sort of risks they're worried about, what they're losing sleep over in their companies, social discord and political instability have landed on that list. So the, the polarization that we're feeling and the, the um, unstableness of our political situation is now becoming a problem for business. And uh, the same way that inflation and uh, natural disasters and cybersecurity. So that's just a stage setter. Davos links it as their second biggest problem um, that the co companies are facing around the world. When we asked PR people whether they thought polarization was a problem for their organization, more than three quarters said yes, uh, either a great deal or a, a moderate amount. So polarization is making it difficult for uh, us to do our jobs. And we said, why is that the case? 
And um, they said it impacts the effectiveness, effectiveness of their communications because they're worried about alienating their customers and alienating their employees uh, with uh, an opinion or a policy or a statement about something that's controversial, that's polarized. But most of all, they think it's bad for the country and therefore bad for their own company. So overall, people think polarization is a problem. I don't know if all of you experience this in your work, but it's certainly something that's impacting a lot of people. And we said, who do you think is responsible for polarization? And most people said both the left and the right. And we created a polarization index at USC that I'll talk to you about a little bit later that some of you may have seen. We launched it 18 months ago. And it's exactly right. Both the left and the right contribute to the polarization we experience right now, which was an interesting surprise for me. I, I didn't think of it in that way, but it's true. And most people begin to see this after you've analyzed these issues. Who is responsible for polarization on the left and the right? Uh, and they're, the main two are media, partisan media outlets, a lot of the cable neat TV shows, and I'll talk about that in a second, and politicians, political strategists, and then, of course, social media platforms that they use to share their uh, views. And what we've un uncovered, which was also an interesting surprise, is this is not by accident. Polarization is not just because people disagree about ideas. It is actually a, stra a strategy to increase ratings, to get votes, to raise money. People use polarization to benefit themselves. Both the media and politicians on both sides do this. And uh, when we asked the PR people that we surveyed uh, which media they thought were the most polarizing, there's no surprise to find that Fox was at the top of the list. But CNN and MSNBC are not far behind. So we see that um, a lot of different publications contribute to the, this um, conflict that we see in, in the news. And on the social media front, it's mainly Facebook and Twitter, uh, followed by YouTube. So a lot of this is playing out, first of all, in the media, but as we see in our polarization index, the players then repeat these media stories that agree with their position in their echo chambers on social media. So it's the media, then these stories are played out on social media, which creates this reverberation and that creates a lot of uh, momentum behind polarization that it normally wouldn't have. So it's, that's the combination, that's how it works. When we said, is business a solution for this social conflict? Can business play a role in this? Um, an astounding 85% of the people we surveyed said yes, that business can be a solution for the problem we're experiencing now. And we also surveyed students. And students thought, almost all the students thought business should be uh, play a role in uh, making our society more harmonious. And we said, why, why do you think business is, uh, should be responsible for this? And there were a number of answers. Um, one is they have a powerful platform. Business has a big megaphone uh, and people listen to businesses. Uh, the bigger they are, the bigger the megaphone. So they have a platform. They're responsible for their employees. So there's a reason that they need to speak out on some of these issues. They have resources to help solve these problems. So they actually can help be part of the solution. And, um, and they have a vested interest in society. Just like before, if it's bad for the country, it's bad for business. So there's a lot of reasons that business is playing a role um, in these social issues. And it's growing. And I'm sure all of you have seen this. We ask. Uh, everybody, whether they thought the number of businesses ag advocate for a cause will increase, and 85% said yes. So this is a, a trend that we're seeing uh, over and over and over. Companies are speaking out more often than they ever have before. It was uh, very apparent during the Black Lives Mo uh, protests of two years ago, and we're seeing it happen more and more across all kinds of different issues. Because it, some people think it enhances their brand reputation. 
it's good for their brand to do this. Some people are, have um, customers who are asking them to do that and employees as well. But most of the people, most of the companies that are involved think it's the right thing to do and that it's, they're committed to social change as long as it's consistent with their values. As you see, nobody's doing this to increase sales. Nobody's doing purpose-driven public relations or marketing to increase sales. They're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. And it's because their customers and in, in, increasingly their employees uh, insist upon it. And the interesting part to me, and this is super valuable and important, is this is right in our strike zone in public relations. This is not an advertising function to talk about corporate purpose and to deal with these controversial issues. If, if you watch the Super Bowl, and we studied that in my branding class this year, there were dozens and dozens of ads on the Super Bowl. Not one was about purpose. They're all about celebrities and being funny and being cute. They're not going to tackle these complicated issues in 30 or 60 minute spots. We asked people, how do you promote? How do you get engage on these issues? And it's on social media, employee communications, media relations, the website, speaking opportunities, activist groups. Advertising hardly ranks at all. So this is, um, this is in our purview. This is what we're all about, is dealing with these issues for our clients and for our companies. And, um, and I think that's uh, a responsibility, but it's also a big opportunity. And because of that, our roles are changing. We asked people over the last five years, how much, how many of you are spending more time de dealing with societal issues than you did before? Almost everybody, 93% said yes. Then we said, how much more time are you spending? And the average that we got back as a response was 43%. So 93% are spending 40% more time dealing with these issues than ever before. We said, what about in the next five years? Again, 94% said it's gonna to continue to increase and they expect that they're gonna spend another 44% more time. So this is becoming our job. This is becoming a reality for everybody that works in, in, in our field. And it is changing the nature of the work we do. It is changing the nature of the people that uh, we hire. It is changing the nature of the classes that we teach. Uh, and it's an, a really interesting time, I think. If I was recently at the Page Society in New York, and this is all they talked about, Every board meeting I go to, this is all they talk about, is which issues should we get involved in? How many can we handle? What should we say? Who should, we, who should say it? What should we do? Every company is struggling to answer these kinds of questions. Because the demands are increasing. We ask people, how many issues? This is one of the questions a lot of people want to know the answer to. How many issues can you as a company be involved with successfully. And you'll see on this chart, it kind of gravitates to, to around three. People feel comfortable with three issues, but there's some like Ben and Jerry's that are way over on the 10 side. They, they're happy to talk about a lot of different issues, but most companies can deal with three or four issues uh, in an in-depth way and take, and take action and commitment on them. So this gives you an idea of the question of how many. Which issues? There is a whole slew of things to choose from uh, as a company. And um, you can choose ones that are highly polarized or ones that are not. The ones in the light blue are the ones that we found in our polarization index are most polarized, are tricky to get involved with. But the public relations people we talk to are most committed to racial equity. And that number has been gone up since the Black Lives Matter protests of two years ago. This is a, a foundational element of our business, and it is a foundational element of our employers. Everybody wants to have racial equity. And it, we work in an industry where that is important because we don't have racial equity. So that's number one. Gender equality, climate change, COVID vaccines, all are things that people are talking about more and more. And you get down the list and then it gets a little trickier. 
when you get to topics like abortion and um, don't say gay, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, but there's a lot of different issues to choose from. And the question is, how do you choose? And most companies do it based on their values. What issues align with their values? What things do they think are happening in the world that they're not happy about based on who they are? And that's a good way to, to begin. This was a quote from the head of activism at Ben & Jerry's. I, did a, I have a podcast at USC, and he said to me, if your company's corporate activism doesn't make somebody mad, it's not worth doing. And we asked people if they agree with that, and, and about 40% did, but almost the same amount didn't. But, but the point is, there's risks associated with making a statement about any particular topic. And if your statement is so bland or your position is so bland that it doesn't offend anybody, then it's probably not worth doing. So, and that's the problem that we have in, in, um, with our clients and with our companies. They wanna say something, but they don't wanna make anybody mad. And that is uh, uh, a, a tough thing to do. But at the same time, we wanna make statements and take actions that are not more polarizing, that are less polarizing, that bring people together. So that's the, our job is to figure out how to craft an, an, a position and how to live out a value that makes a statement about you without making everybody else angry at the same time. It's a tricky combination. Communicating is, in this environment is very complex. We asked PR people, what they thought was most important about their purpose-oriented communication. They thought first it has to be authentic. As I said before, it has to fit the values, it has to be a statement of purpose. There has to be a commitment, some kind of action associated with it. And it's gotta be relevant to customers, employees. That's super important. And a call to action. So there's, these are all characteristics of every statement you make or every decision you make on a societal issue has to have uh, these components uh, associated with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about partnering with activist group. It's pretty low on this list, but it's becoming more and more important as you'll see in a minute. We ask also, when you're creating a policy or uh, uh, making an announcement, do you take polarization into consideration? And um, most people do. It's, they, they're aware of it but it's not totally top of mind. And I think that's gonna become more and more important when we're making an announcement. Think about what is this issue? How is this gonna resonate with people who on the left or the right, or the people in the South or the North or the Republicans or Democrats? What's gonna be the response to that? Because it's important to know that information in advance as much as you can. And we said, when you're making these decisions, do you feel like you have all the information you need? And just slightly over half said yes. So a lot of people are making these decisions on gut instinct. And that's not terrible because it's all about your values. But there are tools out there, more and more tools out there to sort of analyze public opinion and make sure what you're doing is predictable. And at least you know what you're getting into uh, when you get involved with social issues. And the polarization we index we created does exactly that. We are about to launch the, uh, this week, we'll announce the six month update of our polarization index, which we launched um, 18 months ago. So we launched it at one year of research and this is six months. And these are the issues that were um, the top 10 in this current update. And I'll give you just a brief overview, but it, it will be available on the polarizationindex.com in, um, in a week. First of all, despite all the noise about the war in Ukraine and everything else, immigration is still the most polarizing topic in America, largely driven by people on the right. Policing policy is the second one. Abortion has jumped up our list uh, a number of slots uh, the, over the past six months because of the Texas law and, and numerous states that have followed in Texas's um, footsteps, they're threatening Roe versus Wade and it's creating a lot of uh, heat around the, the abortion issue. 
and not many companies talk about abortion. Uh, Lyft and Uber did in Texas, and uh, we had Dominic Carr from Lyft at one of our events at USC, and and they thought a lot of companies were going to join in and follow them, but they didn't. Uh, it's still a, a topic that a lot of companies feel is out of bounds, but I think more and more people, uh, organizations are going to have to talk about it because it's going to be more and more a problem for uh, their employees and their uh, customers. LGBTQ rights also jumped up the list this time. It wasn't even in the top 10, but that's it's having a, a, a revival, uh, mainly uh, in Florida with the don't say gay laws, but there's also other issues about participation in sports and, and things like that that are keeping this top of mind and uh, causing problems for companies, uh, particularly Disney, who may lose uh, some of their valuable um, tax credits in Florida because of their position on don't say gay. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine is interesting. You would think that um, that, that would be less controversial now that the, the pandemic seems to be coming to an end, and, uh, but it's not. Uh, people are still talking about COVID. They're now focused on whether it was effective or not effective, whether there should have been a mandate or not a mandate. So what it shows you is that some of these issues just have a life of their own and, uh, and the media and the politicians extend those lives because it's in their best interest, in, interests. And then there's the Capitol insurrection that happened in January 6th and it was um, a, a, a violent manifestation of polarization. It's sort of like pilot polarization at its worst. And now that issue has become maintained its controversy. It landed in the top 10, mostly driven by the left uh, because of the investigation of the January 6th and the people involved in it. But it's another case where the media and the politicians behind it are going to keep this going. And it's going to be a polarizing issue for a long time. And then there are issues like climate change and others that fell off the list that are decreasing in polarization. And uh, they're a little more safe territory for companies to talk about. So that's just a little brief about uh, where this is. You can read more about it when the report comes out. But it's really fascinating to see how people's opinions change and how quickly they do. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of research uh, that people are doing, like the Polarization Index, to find out what's, how to navigate this uh, uncharted territory. This is what most people are doing. They're monitoring the media, listening to their employees, uh, talking to activists, 30% relying on gut instinct. And as I said, that's not terrible, but it'd be better to have a little more information. And the expertise is deepening. We said, do you have someone on your team who is responsible for corporate activism? In-house, about a third of the respondents do. And in agencies, uh, almost 60% do. So not only is this becoming more of a job for all of us, it's becoming a full-time job for some of us. And um, Ben and Jerry's has a 12 person division uh, called activists. It's not their PR department, it's their activism department. And I think you're gonna see more and more of this uh, in the future as we move forward. Sorry about that. Um, in partnering, I talked about activist groups. Um, when we first did this survey three years ago, we said, how many of you are partnering with activist groups when you have a new policy or a new program to get their insight? And it was a meager 14%. Now, when you add up these first three bars, it's three times as much. So it's uh, people are, um, are uh, beginning to realize that activists are not our enemies. They are people that are knowledgeable about these causes they can help uh, us understand them, and they can help us get it right. And I think that uh, companies that are experienced in this space, like Patagonia, work with a ton of different activist companies, activist groups, in order to um, formulate their own opinions and their own policies. So it's, it's picking up. But management can be reluctant. We ask agencies and in-house, have do, have there been times when you suggested a social purpose kind of campaign and you have met, been met with some reluctance? 
in-house, 45% said yes. Agencies said 60% of agency people said their clients do. So there's not a hundred percent endorsement of getting involved with social issues. A lot of senior management still think that's not their job of their companies, but more and more they're figuring out that it is. And part of our job is to help them feel more comfortable speaking about these issues as an organization and as CEOs. And we said, are your CEOs proactive? On the left is in-house, about a, a little over a third said yes. We have a proactive CEO, CEO but two thirds said not, not so much. On the right is agencies. Uh, apparently agency CEOs are more outspoken than corporate CEOs, but they don't have the same kind of platform as uh, big corporations do. So we've only got about a third of the CEOs right now who are really engaged and, and want to speak out about these types of things. But there are brands, lots of brands are responding. And we ask them, PR professionals, which one do you think are doing the best job of uh, communicating uh, their activists and their, their purpose? Not surprising, the one and two were Ben and Jerry's and Patagonia. They've been at this for a long time, and they know how to do it. And they often get it right. Uh, and then you can see some of the other companies on this list that uh, you may or may not agree whether they're activists but this is what um, the PR professionals said. If you get the report, you'll see that media and students had a different view. They did not pick the same companies as the uh, PR professionals, but more and more companies are uh, becoming uh, activist oriented because they see benefits and uh, they do see that their reputation is being enhanced uh, that uh, with their customers and particularly with their employees that the, uh, the morale improves if the uh, company is speaking up and the employees agree and they support that position. And it's, uh, it can be a really good thing also for hiring. Um, and especially younger people are interested in coming to companies where their values are uh, apparent and they can uh, uh, associate with those and they can work to, to help build those values. And customers too. We all know that more and more customers are looking at a company's values when they decide to purchase a product or subscribe to a service. And uh, we don't see very many who are activist companies who are losing employees or losing customers because of their activism. So to some degree, I think the downside is a, a little bit overrated and the upside is probably underrated, but this is the direction that uh, our business is headed uh, in the foreseeable future. And, uh, and I think it's really exciting. I think that it gives us a, um, an ownable purpose. It uh, up levels the uh, value that we bring to our clients and to our organizations. It uh, deals with the uh, critical problems of our time. And we're at the forefront of this. But it adds a lot of responsibility to our jobs. We have to be experts on all these different topics, and they're complicated. And uh, if you get it wrong, it can have, if you see what's happening with Disney right now, it can be really damaging to your brand and to your revenue. So it's an it, it's an, it's a unbelievable opportunity for public relations, and it's a big responsibility. But I think this is the direction we're headed, and I think this is going to be what our jobs look like in the future. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have about this um, topic or anything that's related to it. Um, anybody have a question? Hi, um, yes, we do have um, a few questions. Um, could you just could you uh, discuss or uh, your point of view on the Musk Twitter news and how it may influence the future role of corporate activism? On, on Twitter? Yes. And Elon Musk. Um, you know, it's interesting. Our polarization index is um, based on Twitter. We, we, look, at, we look at the <clears throat> uh, 450 media outlets as, and they're plotted by Ad Fontes Media as to whether they're reliable or not reliable, whether they're left or whether they're right. And we look at how stories from those media are um, shared on Twitter as an example of uh, 
to find out the polarization level of these different topics. It's an interesting al algorithm that we developed at Golan and USC and with Zignal Labs. Twitter, and people ask why Twitter, uh, and whether uh, or not that is a, a, um, a platform that is run by extremists, whether it is polarized in and of itself. And I think to some degree, that may be true. But we figured from studying, studying polarization, there was no better way to uh, study polarization than to look at where things are most polarized. And that is on Twitter. And it's, um, and it's the platform that I think people are using the most to share their political views inside their own echo chambers. And I think that uh, it's going to continue to be like that. Uh, whether Elon Musk will influence the, uh, the policies of Twitter to the degree that it would be less polarizing, I, I don't know how that would happen. I think that uh, it has uh, uh, a legacy and it is, a, it is a, a tool that's being used widely by media, by political strategists to create these echo chambers like I talked about before. And I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a handful of other questions as well. Um, let's see, we'll go to, someone asked if you could provide more details on the survey sample. The survey sample, the survey sample for um, our global communications report, they're all public relations professionals. Uh, there's about a thousand people took the survey. It was distributed through IPR, PRCA, PRSA, uh, page society all over the world. Most of the respondents are um, from the US. About half of them are overall or from agency and about half are in-house. And then separately, we uh, talked to uh, several hundred students and um, a couple of hundred journalists. So it, it, we, th we've used the same methodology every year for this survey and we, um, um, it's, we get a, a, a really good response. <clears throat> okay, and then um, another, and in the same vein, uh, we have a attendee curious on how activism and PR functions in other countries and regions of the world. That's an interesting question. And uh, I was just presented this information to the Microsoft uh, global communications team at USC. They were here for a few days. And I presented this exact presentation and they were from all over the world. And, uh, and uh, because Microsoft is so huge and all of them felt they were experiencing this in their own countries, but in a different way. And the reason it's different in different countries is not because they're, the polarization at the top is different. It's the issues that create it, that, uh, that change. What we found in the United States is that polarization has not changed very much since Biden took office. It's almost exactly the same as it was when Trump was in office. But the issues that comprise it evolve, as I talked about earlier. So there are some uh, countries where uh, gun control is not a controversial issue. It's just they don't have guns. And, uh, and LGBTQ rights are, are similar in other countries. So the, the issues vary from country to country, but the polarization exists everywhere. And then there are countries where there are really no alternative parties, no alternative points of view. Uh, China might be one. And then it is a different dynamic entirely. So it does play out differently in different parts of the world, but there is an element of, of so societal discord that exists in most places. Thank you. Um, another question it, we have, in becoming more of an activist, uh, are companies not risking extending the polarization into their own area? For example, Team Chick-fil-A versus Team yeah. Ben & Jerry's fighting it out on Twitter. That, and that's the, the best question ever. And I, and I addressed it in our report because um, Chick-fil-A um, was very clear about their their position on um, same-sex marriage. And Nike was very um, 
clear about their position with Colin Kaepernick. And both of them benefited from those positions because their customers shared their values and it was good for their brand. Um, so those are cases where they calculated the polarization that was involved and they took that risk and it played out. But if business is gonna be a solution to reducing polarization, we need to find a way to weigh in on these topics without adding to it. And that is where public relations comes in. We have to choose language that doesn't alienate 50% um, of the people. We have to avoid name calling and uh, dehumanizing of people who don't agree with us. We have to be careful about the information that we share and the facts that we use. Um, you know, it used to be that facts were everything. And, and nowadays facts aren't as important as they used to be because everybody has their own set of facts and they, and they use those to, to support their own points of view. So we have to tell stories that are unifying and uh, are humanizing. And, and I think that's where, that's why I can't, you can't do this with advertising. It's a very nuanced approach. And I think that's what, as a profession, we have to figure out for our clients so that if we're weighing in on these topics, we're not just increasing the conflict that already exists. Okay, great. Um, can you share your thoughts about situations similar to Disney's when employees and regulators are <laughs> pulling in opposite directions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a fascinating case study, uh, Disney, and I don't think it's played out yet. But um, I think that in Florida, you, you can disagree or agree with me or, or with Disney. I think in Florida, this, the don't say gay, um, which is a, relegated to K through third grade, is a, a political strategy. It, they're, bringing it, it, it's, they're bringing attention to the, an ideology and they're using Disney as a, an enemy in order to further their, um, uh, the governor's beliefs in his own career. Um, and I think more and more companies are gonna find themselves in the crosshairs of people who disagree with them. In the beginning, Disney tried not to have a position on it. They tried to work behind the scenes and, uh, and that didn't really play out very well. Their, their employees and many of their big fans were disappointed in them. But it's a, it's a company that has a really broad customer base and uh, from people of all walks of life. So it's not easy for them to come down on one side of an issue like this without offending somebody. So I think that other companies are looking very closely at what hap is happening at Disney. And, they're, and, um, and Spotify, Spotify had the same thing. Um, other companies are watching what's happening and trying to calculate their own uh, strategy for dealing with these kinds of things, because it's gonna be happening more and more and, and we have to be prepared for it. Uh, you know, Lyft and um, Uber spoke out in, in Texas about abortion and uh, nobody had ever done that before. And, and it was a brave move to do it, but it was done because in Lyft's case, the founders of the company just thought that it was something they had to speak about. It was just in, uh, it was in total conflict with their value system and they wanted to speak out about it. And, um, and that was the reason. And so I think that uh, we're gonna see a lot more companies having these uh, discussions and these dialogues and these disagreements, but they're gonna be uh, faced with these kinds of issues. Um. Great. Uh, what should PR practitioners be measuring to track their success on polarizing issues, particularly if, as you mentioned, sales is not the key driver and some degree of disagreement should be considered normal and accepted? Or to put another way, how should, be, how should we be counseling clients slash CEOs to understand success related to these complex issues? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think that we're... Um... You, you, you know, one of the lists I, I put in here were you know, the benefits of, of being an activist company. 
I think that at the very top of the list are your employees. Uh, more and more, they are driving companies who are reluctant to get involved to get involved. And I think your employee morale is an easy thing to measure. And it's one thing that uh, you, you can uh, judge whether you think you're doing the right thing is ask the people who work for you. You can also ask your customers uh, who will vote with their wallets as well. But, uh, you know, what is it that your customers are expecting from you? I think those are two easy ways to judge whether the, the people that are most important to you think you're doing the right thing. Um, you can also look at media coverage. You can look at, as we do at, at social media and Twitter and, and get a lot of information about your brand. We can also take a, a, pick a brand. We can cross-reference it with the polarization index to show how a particular target, for instance, if they spoke out about um, a certain issue on gun control, we can give them an idea of what the response is going to be to their brand on that topic. So there are research methods, but some of it comes back to what you believe and, and what you think your uh, company stands for and your employees stand for. These are good, really good questions. Thank you. There's, we have a ton of great questions that we're going to try to get to. Um, so regarding the current war between Russia and Ukraine, how does a corporate corporation in its activism balance the concerns of its stakeholders and its humanitarian and or political views if they are at odds? That, that's an, it, the, I should have talked about Ukraine because we researched that in the polarization index. That was by far the most talked about issue in the last six months, uh, more than immigration, more than everything else. But it's not the most polarized. So it's a, it's a topic where a company can uh, weigh in on Ukraine without feeling like they're going to be attacked by um, half of the United States. The polarization associated with Ukraine isn't really about the war itself. It's, it's really the right complaining that uh, Biden's not handling it well. They have from the beginning. So that's where the polarization exists. It's not about the war being bad or good. It's about Biden uh, managing it appropriately. So that's where the polarization comes in. So aid to Ukraine and uh, uh, and support of that uh, country is not going to be. Um, it's going to be pretty well received. If you're supporting Biden in that same way there might be people who feel differently about it. But right now, uh, the Ukraine war is uh, uh, not a particularly polar, polarizing topic. And one of the things that struck me in this most recent review is, you know, with the, with the, the COVID-19 being ending and a war starting, you would have thought maybe the country would come together a little bit over some of this stuff, but it's, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Um, so when trying to speak out on behalf of their employees, how should companies determine if they are actually speaking out on behalf of the majority of their employees or being swayed by a vocal minority? Should they survey their employees before speaking out? I think that's a good idea. Uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't always have to be a survey. I mean, you can do focus groups. A lot of employees, you know, as you say, are very vocal. Uh, and so you, you have to be careful that you're listening to the right ones and not just paying attention to the ones that are uh, the most extreme. But um, most companies have resource groups that represent various uh, aspects of uh, you know, society inside their company. I think those are good places to sort of take the temperature. Um, but it's tricky, especially for a global company. We talked about that with Microsoft. Um, these issues reverberate in, they, in different countries in different ways. So it's not always, uh, you're not always going to be able to get a, a, a read um, from uh, doing an employee survey. So, but I think you can, you can take the temperatures of the employees, but ultimately, uh, when you consider that, you've got to combine that with what are the values of the company? What do what the, the senior management stand for? What do the founders stand for? And you, and you put those two things together and hopefully there's a good fit there that'll help you uh, give you some direction 
on, on what you should say or, or what you should do or whether you should do anything at all. You know, some cases, maybe the answer is just to, to steer clear. And then I wanted to circle back real quickly to the Ukraine-Russia topic. Um, yeah. The person who asked the question wanted to know a little bit more about the financial implications of removing its offices or products from the Russian markets. Well, that's a, uh, we work for McDonald's at Golan. They're a, a longtime client, 65 years, I think. And they closed 900 restaurants there. And that is a significant uh, amount of revenue associated with that. So I think that um, for each company, it's different. Uh, for us, for Golan, it wasn't a big, big thing because we just work with affiliates there. We don't have a lot of, you know, full-time employees, that sort of thing. But um, other companies do. So I think the, uh, the decision to uh, pull out of Russia uh, is a, a big decision. And then the question is for companies like healthcare firms who are providing necessary healthcare um, medications or devices or aid to people in Russia, do they pull out? Is that, you know, for hum should they stay in for humanitarian reasons? So that makes it even more complicated uh, for those kinds of companies. So in each case, um, it's a, a different decision. But these are the kind of decisions that are public relations problems. And these are the kind of decisions that we're involved in now. So, and, and they're complex and they're interesting, but they're not easy. Okay. Um, another question we have is, how do you square taking political positions with the value of inclusion that is a part of every company's DEI initiatives? In a politically divided country, is it not more wise and prudent and appropriate for companies to keep politics out of the workplace? Yeah, <laughs> these questions are amazingly good and hard because this is a tough, this is a tough one to answer too. Um, inclusion is super important. And I think we should use language of inclusion when we're talking about any of these issues. We should try to make our positions feel meaningful to people who may not agree with them, which isn't easy to do. Uh, but at the same time, you can't, most companies are gonna have a hard time taking a pass on all of these issues. Uh, there are, um, there are, they're gonna to have to speak out about some of them. You know, like we said, maybe two or three. So they have to choose the ones that they think are the most compatible with their point of view and their values, the ones that are not gonna be as, maybe as damaging to their business, but to try to do it in a unifying way that doesn't alienate half of their customers, half of the country, half of their employees. And that's the tricky part. And, but I think, as I said before, if we're good communicators, we should be able to do that in an effective way if we use the right language and we have the right values uh, that support it, take the right actions. A really good question. Okay. Um, so someone is curious about your perspective on how controversial is defined and is it defined solely by polarization? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question too. Is controversial defined by polarization? Uh, I'm not opposed to controversy. I don't, I think we, our country has always had disagreements and debates since we began uh, in, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, that's healthy. And I think controversy is, is part of uh, democracy. It's, it's part of uh, getting to a right, the right answer. Polarization takes it to another level. And you end up creating these two extremes that after a while look like each other and, and they dehumanize one another and they don't listen to one another. And, um, and, and there is really no way to bridge that gap because there's no listening, there's no talking. And, and so it's, 
it's like uh, there, a woman um, uh, I podcast with wrote a book called High Conflict. And she talks about this, you know, high, when, it's, when it's polarized to the point that you can't even have a conversation. And that's where we are now. We're, we're beyond controversy. We're just at this point where if somebody wears a mask in, or if somebody gets a vaccine or if somebody has a flag on their car, it, it just signals that, um, that they're part of this other group that's not like you or, or is like you. Or, and, and that's what I think, it, that's not controversial. That's when it, that's just becomes a, a point where you can't communicate at all. And I think that's what the polarization we're experiencing now. We saw January 6th in the, in, in the insurgency there. That was a, a perfect example of it. Okay, great. And I think we'll do have time for one more question. Okay. Um, could you uh, define, or someone asked how activism differs from crisis management or the role? Yeah, uh, that's a good yeah. question. Um, activism is, is, I guess you would say it's a little more like issues management. But crisis management and issues management are defensive strategies. It's like, what do you do and say if a product is uh, faulty or if somebody gets killed or if a plane crashes? How do you respond to that? Um, activism is more of a, um, an outward proactive pursuit of uh, a goal. And I think that's the difference. It's, it's, you know, companies always will manage issues that come to their doorstep. What's happening now is they're aggressively, or at least maybe not aggressively, but they're proactively engaging in issues that may not have anything to do with their business at all, um, like gun control. Or, I mean, Levi's is involved heavily with gun control and March for Our Lives. That doesn't really have anything to do with Levi's business. It's just a cause that they proactively engage in and believe in. So activism is more um, proactive and, uh, than, than uh, issues management. But in both cases, you have to understand the issue intimately in order to be effective uh, at communicating about it. So that they do have that in common. Okay. Uh, great. So thank you, Fred. Um, I think that we can wrap up the questions there. Um, we had a ton of fantastic questions. So thank you all for participating and being so engaging. And again, thank you, as always, uh, Fred, for your time and for sharing this information mm -hmm. with, um, with us. So with that, our, again, our this is recorded and will be on our, our website and YouTube channel, along with the resources of the whole for you to download, um, as well as the slide deck uh, for all of those who are interested. Um, our uh, one IPR related announcement, we do have our last race in the PR classroom of the season this, April, uh, this Thursday, April 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So be sure to check out online on our website and our social to register for that. Um, but again, thank you, Fred, and everyone, I hope you have a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, Fred. Bye, Fred.